Okay, let's get started. Uh, for those of you that made it to Tom Lee's talk last week, what did you think? Pretty amazing, huh? Yes, exactly. Literally, in the case of the provost. I have never seen EEG done live in real time. I don't know if you noticed while the provost was wearing the EEG helmet and Tan Lee was, was standing next to him and she was speaking. The activity in his brain was going in sync with her words. That was pretty amazing. Okay, we will come back and talk about Emotive Corporation's mobile EEG device in our last lecture when we talk about cyborg technology or uh, what's better known today as brain-computer interaction. Emotive's helmet obviously is still something you wear. It's still over the skin uh, or over the skull, but there are technologies that are already here which are being implanted surgically and interact with humans in extremely intimate ways, and we'll talk about that uh, in the last lecture. Okay, but before we get there, uh, we're working our way through this section on looking outward and thinking about distributing technologies out into the world, where those technologies are participating directly in the physical world along with us, unlike our laptops and even our smartphones, which are more connected to the internet than they are to the real world, right? There, there are very different implications in the ways in which those technologies interact with the world and interact with us. And we've talked about ubiquitous computing, embedded devices, and we're now working our way through a five-part lecture series on robotics, which are basically mobile embedded devices. They're machines that have sensors like the intelligent light sensors in the Davis Center. But unlike embedded devices, they can also often move themselves, which creates a rich kinds of interactions with the environment. And we saw a bunch of those kinds of interactions that emerge when we have a machine that's moving about, pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. And we looked at Breitenberg vehicles in the last lecture. Remember that HCI is kind of a, an odd uh, course in the, human, in the computer science curriculum. It's sort of a mixture of computer science, but also psychology. So today in lecture 21, we're gonna go back to psychology and think about robots from a psychological perspective and think about some additional ideas in cognition, which is situated cognition and embodied cognition. If you remember back to our lectures on psychology, we looked at various aspects of cognition. We're going to add to that list today, situated cognition and embodied cognition. Okay. The deliverables, uh, hopefully you are nearing completion of the 10th and final deliverable, which is due tomorrow night. And then in class on Thursday morning, we'll talk about what you'll be doing in terms of your final project between uh, Thursday and the end of the semester. All good? Any questions about the deliverables, deliverable 10? No? Okay, so we almost finished uh, lecture 20 last time. We were on uh, the last slide, and we were looking at this idea of, we were looking at this idea of trying to put together multiple <coughs> Breitenberg vehicles, and just to remind you, a Breitenberg vehicle usually has a pair of sensors up front, a pair of wheels in the back, crossed or uncrossed connections. And those connections can either be positive or negative. Positive means the more strongly the sensor fires, the more strongly the wheel, or the more faster the wheel turns that that sensor is connected to. An inhibitory or a negative connection means the stronger that the sensor fires, the more strongly it inhibits whatever it's attached to. In our cases, it's, in our case, it's attached to a wheel, so the more strongly the sensor fires, the slower the wheel turns. Right? In order to start to build up an understanding of robotics, one way we can do that is to take basic Breitenberg vehicles and start to embed them in a growing uh, if-then-else statement, a, a set of uh, nested if-then-else statements, where given current sensation, for example, in our hypothetical robots here that have these grippers on the front and touch sensors on the inside of the grippers, if those touch sensors are firing, in other words, the robot is holding something, then the robot acts like this particular Breitenberg vehicle. If, on the other hand, it is not holding an object, what kind of Breitenberg vehicle might be appropriate? Remember that our robot is, uh, there are multiple robots that are moving around in a swarm. 
They, are, they have light sensors, heat sensors, and sound sensors, and a grip, uh, gripper. We have objects scattered over a wide area with light sources attached to them, and we want the robots to find those objects and then bring those objects to a central location, which is indicated by a heat source. Makes sense that if the robot is holding something, it should drive towards the heat. If it's not holding something, it should drive towards light that's not near heat. That's right. It should drive near light, but it might be near heat. That's right. So we might, in our cartoon example here, as a first approximation, we probably want it to do phototaxis, which means move towards the light. But if we have robots that are bringing light sources to round, towards the heat, then after a while, most of the light is going to also be near the heat. So we could try and create a Bradenburg vehicle down here that goes towards light and away from heat. Probably a good idea. What else matters here? This is an exercise in thinking about physical context as it relates to our robots here. Um, if you can use sound, it would make sense to have uh, the robots follow sound to a certain proximity. Okay. Um, have all the robots emit a sound. Okay. And then at a certain proximity, don't, not get any closer because the robots will follow each other. It's like ants, so one finds. Okay, so we could try and get, following. that's a good idea. We could try and get the robots themselves to aggregate and then they all go looking for light sources. So maybe they emit a sound and they're attracted to sound. How else might we want to use sound here as the robots are going about their business? Absolutely, right? So we don't want them to collide into each other. These are multi-million dollar robot rovers, very expensive hardware. How would we do that? Create a simple Bradenburg vehicle that avoids sound. Are there any issues there? Um, <clears throat> one thought is to, to avoid sound of a certain level so that you don't get too close. Absolutely, right? So that, that makes sense. Again, we mentioned that before. There's probably a sweet spot. If it's quiet, everything's fine. But if things get too loud, turn away from the sound. What if the light of the heat source emits sound? Though? What if the light of the heat source makes sound, right? So there's a lot of unwritten requirements here. Let's assume that they don't make sound. What else other than other robots might be making sound? You yourself. <laughs> you yourself, right? So if you're avoiding sound and you're obviously hearing yourself, and you are probably going to be the loudest thing, that might affect how it actually moves, right? There's a, there's a hidden physical context there, which is, is the robot hearing itself? So how would we deal with that? Again, we might think about instrumenting the robots differently and so on. Okay, a good exercise to start to build up an intuition for the challenges of robotics. And again, taking what we know about HCI, about thinking carefully about physical context in this case, and bringing it to bear on this problem. Okay, so we, we spent last time talking about sort of the basic things that make up a robotic, uh, a robot. This isn't a robotics course, so we're not going to go into too much more detail than that. The takeaway from this lecture is, again, we, if we want our robots to do something or interact with humans even, <coughs> instead of making an overly complicated robot, and I, as you now know by writing lots of code, the more complicated your code is, the more that can go wrong with it. That is true of robotics as well. We'd like to keep our robot as simple as possible and think creatively and think out of the box about how rich interactions arise given the interactions between a simple agent or simple robot and a rich environment. So phototaxis, for example, uh, or photophobia, running away from the light may not be the most uh, exciting behavior you can think of, but it's the building block of a lot of other behaviors. You can start to get relatively rich dynamics with relatively simple machines. So that's what we're focusing on in the next four lectures on robotics. Not so much the robots themselves, but how they interact with their physical world and possibly, if we're going to put them in uh, nearby humans, how they might interact with humans. Okay, so that finishes lecture 20. Again, we're going to talk about situating body cognition now. In lecture 20, we thought about how robots interact with physical environments. We probably will get to lecture 22 today. We're going to think about robots not just interacting with the physical environment, but also interacting with the social environment of people. 
This makes things very complicated. We just did a little sort of thought exercise, uh, a thought experiment in robot-robot -robot interaction. What happens when we try and put lots of robots together to get them to do something together that would be difficult or impossible for one of them to do on their own. And we'll conclude in lecture 24 by thinking about more and more robots interacting with more and more people all the time. So sort of the ubiquitous technology version of robotics. We're not there yet, but it's coming. And we can use a lot of what we've learned about HCI to help design that kind of technology. OK, situated and embodied cognition. People, humans, are situated and they're embodied. Embodied is a, little, is a little bit easier to think about. It's a simple idea that you have a body. And for our purposes, your body is a tool. You can use that body to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. You are an active, curious agent in the world. A computer also has a body. It's encased in some plastic case. But most computers cannot use their body as a tool. They can't use it to actively interrogate or influence the world around them. They can in an indirect manner by sending packets between uh, each other and so on. It's not so interesting for our purposes. We're thinking about interactions with the physical world. People are also situated. By situated, we mean that we have sense organs. We are situated in the world. We sense the world more or less in real time. Our ability to sense the world is not perfect. I know more or less what's going on in this room, less about what's going on in the hallway, and forget about what's happening in the building next door. However, in this particular physical context, I'm situated. I'm sensing it in real time directly. Rather than a computer, which is non-situated, a computer has to sort of wait for input from the outside world. That may be a human typing something in on a keyboard or a mouse or receiving packets from a computer. A computer does receive input from the outside world, but it's passive and usually not in real time. OK, so let's start with this idea of embodied cognition. I am embodied, I have a body, and I can use that as a tool to learn about the world. And that tool is a big part of my cognition. So as a child, you were all very active, and you used your body to get into trouble and learn things about the world. That's the idea of embodied cognition, that all the abstract thinking that you're now capable of, mathematics, uh, ma mathematics, uh, language, art, anything where you can sort of close your eyes and think about something where you are no longer using your body. It's non-embodied cognition. You could do math in your head, more or less. The idea of embodied cognition is your body supported that whole process. It was the scaffolding to do that. Most of us learned to count by pressing on the digits of our hand. You can now close your eyes and can't count and do much more complex mathematics. But the foundation for that, the scaffolding, was your embodiment. That's the idea of embodiment. So again, there are a lot of things out there, a lot of technologies that have a physical body, but they cannot use it. Here's my little Lego Mindstorms robot kit here. Uh, this little thing is embodied in the sense when it moves, its distance to this object grows less. And if it can sense that, it can sense the distance, then it's sensing the repercussion of that, that action. OK. So if you have a body that can move, and you can see that moving will cause immediate feedback. You get, you're creating this immediate interaction with your environment, and it's somewhat under your control. Situated cognition, again, is this idea that you're able to sense the world uh, in real time, and you're physically situated in the world, and you're able to do that. So uh, an embedded device is situated. It can sense something in real time. So the intelligent light sensors and the Davis Center, they are situated. There are changes in the light levels in the room of a Davis Center, and those are being detected in real time uh, by a machine. Unlike embodiment, unlike your own body, which you have control over, usually the thing that you're sensing is not under your control. Things are changing, uh, and you can't influence them very well. If you're situated, you don't have to wait for a signal from the device to change. It's coming to you in real time. Okay. A wireless sensor network or a wireless sensor senses changes in light levels. They change regardless of whether the device records them or not. What are some other technologies you can think of that are situated? 
They're recording information from the real world in real time that's not so much under their control. Nest? Nest being like the temperature gauge in the house? Absolutely. So smart home technologies that are recording information about the home in real time. Uh, like a weather station? A weather station, absolutely. Yeah, it's more or less not moving. It's not embodied, but it's situated. What about leap motion? Leap motion, exactly. As long as it's on, it's sensing infrared information through the cameras. Absolutely, it's a good example. Okay, so those are all examples of situated technology. Traditional laptops and desktops, if we ignore the webcam that's on and the microphone, they're waiting for information from the user. They are non-situated. If we consider something, a technology or an organism that is both embodied and situated, from now on I'll refer to those as a complete agent. They're complete in the sense that they can push against the world, they're embodied, and they can sense the repercussions of their actions. They're situated. They have both capabilities. In the reading for today, the reading lists five properties of complete, complete agents. And again, agent is going to be our shorthand for technology or organisms. There are five properties that they have that systems that are not embodied or not situated or both do not have. We're going to just look at the first three, which are important for us. If you're thinking about writing code for a device that can push against the world and, and observe how the world pushes back, you have a rich palette of interactions that are available to you, and you can think about how to get that machine to exploit those interactions. The first one, Clearly, if you have a body, it's sort of an obvious one. You're subject to the laws of physics, right? You are not a virtual machine inside a physical machine. You have mass, weight, inertia, and so on. These things might be useful depending on what you're trying to get the machine to do. The machines not only sense because they're situated, they're not only recording information coming from the outside world, but when they move, they generate sensory stimulation of their own. So again, if someone in the back of the room is occluded, I can move and generate new sensory stimulation. I can unocclude someone at the back of the room. And then finally, they affect their environment themselves. Some of that, uh, some of that effect they may be able to sense, and some they may not. And again, that may be useful. OK. So why is this important for HCI? Why are these three properties important for HCI? If you don't think about it too deeply, they seem sort of like uh, they seem sort of like hindrances, right? Subject to the laws of physics, this thing is heavy. It's going to have to exert energy to get around. Uh, it's generating sensory stimulation. It affects the environment, maybe in a bad way. So in HCI, we want to try and turn that around and think about these things as potential and opportunity for interaction. How do we exploit these things to produce the kind of interaction that we that we want? Okay, let's look at kind of a fun uh, example here. Let's go back to another space example. We're not now building a robot swarm to uh, explore Mars. Instead, we want to detect various information about the uh, atmosphere and the surface of Saturn's moon Titan. More specifically, NASA would like us to get pressure, temperature, and chemical composition from different levels of the atmosphere on Titan, collect aerial images, and also images from the ground. Solution one is we could design a satellite, send it to Titan, and put it in, uh, put it in orbit around Titan. And with very careful uh, reflection, uh, with different kinds of reflectances, we can bounce signals off different levels of the environment and get all the information we want. It's difficult, but not impossible to do so. It would take a lot of code to get that right. We could do that. Or option B, we could send people. Haven't managed to do that yet. It's on the drawing board, not there yet. Got to do this with machines that are going to interact with Titan in some way to get this information we want. What about um, a satellite <coughs> orbit that will drop a probe that goes to the atmosphere, records data, each level, and then lands on the ground and then sends up that information? Absolutely. Drop a probe from a satellite, right? A probe can be a complete agent. It's going to sense the information we want, and it has a body which has mass, which will draw it towards the surface of Titan, 
And as long as the mass is not too big or we put a parachute on, it will not destroy itself when it reaches the surface, which of course is exactly what NASA did. When was that? What was the probe? Anybody remember? So this was, these images were sent back in January 2015, and this was, sorry, 2005. Uh, this was the Huygens probe, which did exactly that. It was designed in such a way that it dropped through the atmosphere at a slow enough pace that it was able to collect this information at different levels of the atmosphere, and it actually reached the surface and sent back those images. Um, the team, the team leader for the Huygens probe was at Cornell when I was a postdoc there. Uh, he had a viewing party at Cornell, and we got to sit in a room and actually see that image put up on the screen for the first time as it was beamed back by the Huygens probe in 2005. It was very, very exciting. Anyways, again, sort of an obvious example of HCI, we're simply going to exploit the fact that objects are subject to gravity. Simple. Okay. Let's look at a little more HCI-related uh, example. Um, another uh, important issue for complete agents, for robots and AI, is if they're going to live in the world around them, they need to be able to see. And the field of computer vision, this is sort of a subset of the field of AI as a whole. People have been trying to get robots to see since the 1950s, and it turned out, in retrospect, to be an extremely difficult thing to do. I just changed the slide this morning. It's used to say it is one of the most difficult problems in computer vision. Now it's, it was one of the most difficult issues in computer vision. Inside computer vision, there's a subset of problems known as image segmentation. You have an image and you want to find the person in it, the cat in it, the house in it, the car in it, and so on. You want to try and segment, segment foreground from background and then reason about the object that's in the foreground. Is it a human being? Is it a male? Is it a female? Do you know exactly who it is? and so on, it turns out to be an extremely difficult problem. It's not unlike your leap motion device, right? You have an N by M set of RGB values, red, green, blue values. You have a whole bunch of colored pixels, and you need to take as input all those colored pixels and output the string Marilyn Monroe, right? It turns out it's a very difficult thing to do. People have been working on this for a long time, and this actually spurred the development of deep learning and deep networks which again are very powerful, but very sophisticated and very complicated. Is there a simpler way that we could enable a complete agent to learn about the world around it? The non-embodied approach to image segmentation is to take a million images and train a deep neural network to recognize the presence or absence of people in those images. We're gonna look at the embodied approach to this problem. It's a different approach to the problem. They both have pros and cons. What I want you to take away from BabyBot here is that BabyBot itself is like a Breitenberg vehicle. It's very, very simple, but the designers thought carefully about how BabyBot interacts with its environment and interacts in such a way that it segments the world around it easier than a deep neural network does. It learns about, it's able to separate foreground from background in a much easier way then would be required for a deep neural network. That's the idea here. Okay, this is BabyBot. Obviously, it's mechanically more complex than Breitenberg vehicles. We have many more than two motors and two sensors and two wires, but actually not too many more. BabyBot was investigated back in the 1990s. As you can see in the little cartoon here, BabyBot has two cameras uh, for eyes. And those two, we're gonna get images back from those two cameras. But instead of combining them and try and infer a 3D picture, instead we're gonna take those two images and we're gonna visit every pixel in the, in the combined images and we're gonna look for pixels in which there is motion and in which there is not. So basically what BabyBot is trying to do is figure out what, which part of its visual field is moving and which part is not. Okay, how does it do that? The simple way to do that you look at the current pair of images and you look at the previous pair of images and you line up one pixel. If the color has changed at that pixel, then something probably moved there. Makes sense. You could be looking at, you could be looking at a television. The television itself is not moving. The colors are changing. But we're going to assume for the moment 
that change in color at a given pixel represents movement at that pixel. If the color of a pixel does not change from one time step to the next, no motion. Okay, so that's what the three cartoons on the very, in the right-hand column are showing you. Everything that's grayed out from BabyBot's point of view at that point in time is not moving. Everything that's opaque that you see there is moving. That's BabyBot's foreground. It's sort of focusing on things that move and ignoring everything that doesn't. So far, so good. So BabyBot is situated. It has these cameras. It can see. It's got very limited sensing capability. It just sees motion or lack of motion. BabyBot is also embodied. It has a body, and it's going to use that body as a tool to learn about the objects around it. OK. BabyBot doesn't know much about its own body. All it knows is that it has two motors, motor one and motor two. <clears throat> BabyBot is a baby. We're going to assume it doesn't know much about its world. So it just starts to move at random. It sends some commands to its motors, and its arm starts to move. We're going to assume for the moment that it cannot feel its arm. We'll assume for our purposes the only thing it can sense is motion, no motion. It sends commands to the motors, and all of a sudden, this big blob enters its visual field from the left. What can BabyBot infer about its world, given that embodied, situated feedback loop? It's turning towards a big blob. It's turning towards a big blob? Possibly. Actually, that's a good one. That is an alternative hypothesis. Maybe it's moving, and something else is moving. But if it was moving, Everything in its visual field would be moving. For BabyBot at the moment, most of what it sees is not moving, but there is this blob on the left that is moving. What can it infer about this blob on the left? It's not what you just said that it's moving. It, that it is moving, right? So BabyBot is sending commands, and it sees this blob. It stops sending commands and suddenly everything in its field goes still again. It sends commands to the motors, and that blob, whatever that blob thing is, shows up again. Every time it sends motor commands, that blob shows up. So it's touching it, it's moving it? Right. It's moving its arm. Right, so, so if every time it moves its arm, the blob shows up, that means that every time it moves its arm, it's a moving object, right? It's like the contact. It's actually the other way around. You've got to think about this from BabyBot's point of view. The blob is me. Right? I, whatever this blob is, whenever, whenever I send commands to the motors, it shows up. When I don't, it doesn't. That's my definition of me. One of the, things that com one of the challenges that confronts ba real babies, along with baby bot, is distin distinguishing self from everything else that's out there. Right? How do I know that this is my arm, but that is Jack's arm? There is an important difference between those two things, and the difference has to do with embodiment. This thing I have control over, that thing I don't. So the first thing that BabyBot is learning about its world is the fact that it has control over this thing. So um, that's great. BabyBot continues sending commands to the motors, and this blob moves from the left, and it moves through the right through its visual field, and then something very surprising happens. The shape of the blob changes. That's surprising. What can BabyBot start to infer about that? It would have to infer that it was a continuation of self. Maybe. It says, aha, well, what it, this blob, that self, self has suddenly changed. It ha now has a different shape. It has this shape. However, let's assuming that it does this, it stops moving its hand, so the hand suddenly disappears. But the apple rolls a little bit and then comes to a stop. Now BabyBot is really confused, right? All right, there are two blobs. The first thing, that blob only appears when I move. The second one, its appearance or disappearance is less under my control. What can I say about this thing, this blob? It's not the baby. From BabyBot's point of view, the only thing it knows about the external world for the moment is that the external world is shaped like an apple. That's it. Not much, but it's a start. Okay. 
You can probably start to figure out the game from here. Assuming that all BabyBot really can do is this, what can BabyBot start to learn about the world around it, which as you can see in this experiment is simply a bunch of fruit on the table in front of it? What can it learn about its world? How many unique items there are? Aha, uh -huh, how many unique items there are. So maybe it keeps moving around and suddenly this grape-shaped blob starts to move and that blob moves independently of the apple-shaped blob. So BabyBot says, aha, there's two things out there. I'm going to name the first one apple, for example, and I'm going to name the second thing grapes, for example. It's unlikely it's going to come up with those actual words. Maybe it's thing one and thing two, but we'll assume it has, it's named these two things. It also learns that there is these things and these things out there. So it knows there's four different things out there in addition to self. What else can it start to learn about these things? I mean, it might start to learn a little bit about physics, just how big it is. Absolutely. It's going to start to learn about physics now, right? The first thing is enumeration. There's more than one thing out there, right? So now it's going to start to learn about physics. And it might learn that the apple-shaped thing, that blob, will continue to move even after self has stopped pushing against it. But the thing called grapes and bananas do not. They stop immediately when I stop pushing against them. So things called apples and things called oranges have a property which I'm going to call, which BabyBot is going to call rollable. And it's going to discover that grapes and banana have the negative of that property. They're not rollable. Right? So now it's gone from learning about nouns to adverbs. What are the repercussions of pushing against something and causing it to roll? What else? What other, what other aspects of simple physics can BabyBot start to figure out because it's embodied and situated? It can push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. I mean, density, depending on like if you were to just like they would just like drop their hand on the banana and like smush it. Absolutely, right? So some of these things are smushable and some are not. Actually, probably most of them are smushable, but we could put some plastic trucks up there, little toys, and I could start to learn that there are things that are smush smushable and things that are not. Smushable is a good one because smushable means change in geometry, change of shape, right? Generally speaking, most of the things that BabyBot might do to these objects, the shape themselves stays the same, but the position might change. So one of the first things that BabyBot learns about physics is that when things move, they also do not tend to change shape. That's maybe not so true about the bunches of grapes, but again, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of BabyBot, right? You all have a very good understanding of intuitive physics and also formal physics, but BabyBot is starting tabula rasa without knowing much of anything, right? So things tend to maintain shape when they move, not all the time, and it turns out there are certain actions that I can perform that change shape. What else? It requires force to push things. It requires force, right? So maybe a little bit, nothing happens. How much force does it require? BabyBot might start to learn that things that are bigger require more force to push. So volume is, generally speaking, a good proxy for pushableness. Right? It might start to infer that volume and mass are kind of correlated, but not always. There is a lot of physics that BabyBot can learn with just motion, no motion, and just things like that. Right? So it's not unlike, again, the Breitenberg vehicles. BabyBot might look complex, but it's actually very, very simple. But by writing code for BabyBot that allows it to interact with its environment in the right way, it can start to learn a lot about the world around it. Rather than creating a deep neural network and collecting a million pictures of Marilyn Monroe and an additional million pictures in which Marilyn Monroe is not present and teach a deep learner to distinguish between presence or absence of Marilyn Monroe, maybe if we think about interaction with the world, we can do things in a simpler manner. It's an important intersection between the study of robotics and HCI. Okay. Okay, so again, complete agents are situated and embodied. 
They also typically have a third form of cognition, which is distributed cognition. And this one's kind of controversial. Typically, when we think of cognition, we think about what's going on inside your brain, or in the case of a machine, what's going on uh, inside uh, the code running inside that machine. But if we have machines that are interacting with the world around them, and as we're going to see in the next lecture, we have machines that are interacting with other machines or other humans, you can start to think about cognition as something that's actually better thought of as distributing, being distributed across the learner and the world itself, right? So if you think about BabyBot, where is the cognition? There's code inside the head of BabyBot that's doing a lot of the, that's causing a lot of the actions. But the important things that are going on, the pushing against and observing what happens, that's going on in the realm of BabyBot and its immediate environment. So in psychology, there's a lot of uh, interesting discussion about this idea of distributed cognition. We want to try and understand what cognition is and make machines cognitive, make them smart. Better to think not just about writing the code that sits inside the machine, but to think about how that code causes interactions between the machine and the world around it. Here's one example of that. We have agent one and agent two. Again, these could be machines or organisms. And remember that whatever's coming in is being transform, transformed and then is going out as output or actuation, action on the world. And that action might be sensed by another agent which acts and so on. Agent one says something or does something that's received by agent two. Agent two cogitates and then does something in response to what agent two sensed. But agent one is watching that. Agent one does not know what's going on inside the head of agent two, but starts to build up a mental model of what's going on inside agent two. Right? In the last lecture, when we looked at Breitenberg vehicles, we cheated because we, we knew what was going on inside the vehicles. Imagine you went back to lecture 20 and you went through the vehicles again, but assume you don't know about the wiring inside. You would have to build up a mental model of what's going on inside the vehicle. Are they cross connections? Are they uncrossed? Is it positive or negative connections? When we interact with other humans or other organisms or even other machines, that's what we're doing. We're building up a mental model of it. But building up that mental model requires interaction. So we're distributing our cognition across this interaction. OK. OK. How do we build up those mental models? We've mentioned this before, this idea of affordances. So the built environment that humans have built if you look around your environment, there are hundreds or thousands of affordances out there that advertise how they should uh, be used. I can't see the door handles for these doors, but a simple example is door handles, right? You go through hundreds of doors every day. Do you push, do you pull? Hopefully the door handle advertises how. This one's pretty good. This one, I'm not so sure. And even if we get the affordances right, we don't always pay attention to them. Okay. So if we are going to start to instrument, if we're going to start to build robots, are we going to have to build affordances as well? What sort of advertisements are we going to have to put there out there in the world to help them know what to do in certain circumstances? Kind of interesting to think about. OK. We just talked about embodiment, having a body to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. The body does not necessarily have to be physical. If you think about virtual environments, you often have an avatar which the avatar itself has a body and that body is a proxy for your own physical body. In the next theme of the course, when we talk about looking inward, we're going to talk about virtual reality and augmented reality. So we're just going to sort of dip into that for a moment. One interesting aspect of HCI is the creation of virtual worlds. Sometimes this is for gaming, but not always. We create rich virtual environments, and we have avatars moving around in there. Are the avatars themselves complete agents? Do they have bodies with which they can push against the virtual world and observe how the virtual world pushes back? These days, the answer is usually yes, right? And the question is what? What actions are available? How can you use an avatar's body to learn about the virtual environment that the avatar is in? 
Okay. Think about your favorite virtual environment that's out there. Again, this is a dated slide. This is from Second Life. I don't know if Second Life still exists, but there you go. It does? Okay. It's pretty popular a few years back. Um, what sorts of affordances exist in Second Life or World of Warcraft or Minecraft? What affordances are there that signal to you, the user or the player, what your avatar's body can and can't do in that environment? A tutorial, okay, yes. So we could explicitly do it, right? But a tutorial in a way is kind of cheating, right? As HCI designers, we might be able to shorten or do away with the tutorial altogether by putting affordances out there. You just know what's possible and what's not given what you see in the virtual world. Like physical boundary. Physical boundary, how is that, how is that advertised in certain virtual worlds? So either, normally you can yeah, sometimes it's hard to tell, right? You just know. That's often a sign of a good affordance. It's clear, but you might not even know why. Um, UI is really important. All the other things you mentioned, Minecraft, Tech, and Minecraft, yep. Warcraft, all have really big UIs where every button is like laid out to a what thing that you can see. A button is is assigned to everything you can see. Yeah, and so you can see like you know if you if you look down, you see like one above you know, uh -huh. the action and like two below. That means you can press one or press two, you know. Okay, okay, again, we can do that. But again, that's kind of cheating, right? That's kind of like in your sign language program where you say, put your hand over the center of the device. You could write that, but instead you could show it. Margaret? You can press buttons and see how the avatar moves, right? But that's not really an affordance. We're looking things that are in the virtual world that say, I can be used in this way. So I guess an implication like Red Dead Redemption 2 just came out. And okay. You see a horse, right? Okay. And you're an avatar. And you okay. walk towards the horse. The implication is that you can fly. Okay, so that's a great example. In the old days, the original virtual worlds, there was often like a halo around objects, right? Those were things that could be interacted with. Anything that didn't have a halo. It's just art, right? It's just, it's just there, but it cannot be interacted with. Again, that's kind of cheating. You can do that in a virtual world, but are things that are more subtle? I mean, in terms of boundaries, it's not really subtle, but like, if you, like a lot of times it's like a wall or a cliff, and the wall you can't get over and the cliff, it's pretty clear what happens if you go off it. Absolutely, right? Walls and cliffs are, signal something pretty obvious most of the time. Uh, a lot of applications like Club Penguin and stuff, uh, you have like doorways to get to okay. So doors, right, all the way back to the, the first video games, right? That one's, that one's pretty clear. If someone went to the effort of actually putting a door in the virtual environment, it usually means it can be opened. Maybe it can be pushed, maybe it can be pulled, but you can get through it somehow. Possibly, yeah, exactly. Things that are in the distance are kind of washed out. The level of detail in modern games today confuses the old folks like myself who figure that it's rendered so clearly that you can interact with the waving grass, but you can't. It's just art. Right? Okay. Here's my little simple example here. I went for a walk in Second Life a while back, and you see these chairs, which you can sit in in various ways. There's a chair that's sitting on the edge of a cliff looking out over a beautiful sunset. It's a chair meant for quiet reflection in Second Life. They have stadiums where obviously public events go on. Um, there was a short period in Second Life where companies thought they could get rich by advertising things in the virtual environment. So they have corporate retreats and they get a whole bunch of avatars to come and sit around a conference table and then a sales representative would try and sell you something in the virtual world very corporate thinking, but, but there you go, right? A table with a bunch of chairs arranged around it. If you see that in a virtual world, it means someone wants a bunch of people to sit together and do something together at the same time, right? So chairs and how they're arranged, again, a simple example, but they're affordances, right? Remember, chairs afford, I can be sat in, and we arrange them in certain ways, and that alters the advertisement that's being sent. Okay, so let's just take a step back now. We've introduced this idea of embodied cognition and situated cognition. They're not quite the same thing, so it's worthwhile thinking about different kinds of agents 
and whether or not they are embodied or situated. Again, our agents can be either biological things or uh, man-made things. What are some examples of agents that are disembodied and not situated? Google. Google, okay, yeah, right. So the search engine. The search engine itself. So yeah. pretty much any, any software would be an example of that. Yep. Yeah. What else? Any kind of cloud-based service. Okay, cloud-based service. So the cloud, that's a good that's a good example. Yeah. Pretty disembodied and non-situated. Old laptops and desktops, old computers, if they didn't have a webcam or they didn't have any sensors of their own, again, they're they're physical, they have a, they're in a box, but that box is not a tool that they can use to learn about the world around them. So they're non-embodied and non-situated. What about uh, situated but non-embodied? We mentioned some in this lecture already. Chatbots. Chatbots are also non. Uh, are, chatbots are not really situated. They have to wait for someone to chat to them. Um, like a light sensor. The light sensors, right? So any embedded technology. So all the technology we saw in the three lectures on ubiquitous computing, those are more or less uh, situated but non-embodied. The technology themselves cannot interact with the world. My phone is situated, it's got sensors in real time, but it can't do much on its own. I can alter what it's sensing by moving, but uh, this is the body that's doing the moving, not the device itself, right? So a smartphone, you can also consider situated, but non-embodied. The inverse is a little trickier, embodied, but not situated. You have a body with which you can push against the world, but you cannot observe the repercussions of your actions. Uh, okay, others? You have to intentionally disable anything. Maybe. What about the windmill? A windmill? Okay, I guess so. And we're going to try and focus on technology. I mean, a windmill may be. Anything that's purely mechanical, that's a good point. They are embodied, they move, they impact their world, but they cannot sense the repercussions. So yeah, any mechanical device, I guess, would qualify here. Something where it's like a human doing all of the processing, so like a claw machine or a ah. bionic arm. Okay, good point, right? So any machine, a bionic arm or a claw machine, or the example I have here is an industrial robot arm, Things that can actually move, but they don't have sensors themselves. So modern industrial robo robots that are working in factories, they do have sensors now, but in the old days, you just program them to do the exact same thing over and over again. They would weld this particular part of the car. When the car is moved into position, moved out, the next one comes. And uh, the old industrial robots were programmed to do the same thing over and over again at very high precision. And in a factory where everything is controlled, they don't need to sense the repercussions of their action, right? Because the, the environment is controlled for them. What about embodied and situated? Like a Tesla? A Tesla, sure. Any sort of modern technology, any autonomous car, cars move, and, and most of them sense the repercussions of their actions these days. Or the Boston Dynamics robots? The Boston Dynamics robots, so any autonomous car, Anybody have a Roomba at home? Not as sexy, but definitely embodied and situated. I would say that the Twitch Plays Robotics robots are both. Okay, yeah, the Twitch Plays Robotics robots, the ones that I showed you that we stream to Twitch, they move and they sense the repercussions of their actions, but they're not physical. Another good reminder that embodiment doesn't necessarily mean physicality. For disembodied? And non-situated? So that's, that's something that doesn't have a body and can't sense the repercussions of its actions. So that would be like a traditional desktop. It has no webcam. It's getting input, but only passively from, from a user. That's technology. What about biological things? Us. Us, right? And every other species on the planet. From a Darwinian point of view, it's not a good idea 
to not be able to influence your environment and not sense the repercussions of your actions, right? Okay, so traditional computers in the top left, industrial robots in the top right, or purely mechanical devices, that's a good, that's a good point as well. Embedded devices can sense, but they can't themselves move or impact the world. Here, every single biological organism exists in this cell, but we're only just starting to be able to create technologies that are both embodied and situated. We're just starting to figure out how to do that. The reason it's so difficult is because if you can push against the world, there are a million ways you can push against the world in the wrong way. Think back to baby bot here pushing against pieces of fruit. Luckily, there's no humans nearby, right? A lot of things becomes much more interesting, but also much more dangerous when you have machines that can push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. If you want to learn about how to do that well, you usually have to make a lot of mistakes. Right? Okay. So that's what's going on in robotics and AI. How do we create embodied and situated machines? How do we allow them to learn, to move around in the world to be safe? But how do we teach them how to learn in a safe manner? Right? Not an easy thing to do. Okay, let's finish uh, this lecture by going back to virtual worlds. You're going to turn to your neighbor and you can pick whatever virtual world you want, doesn't really matter. Um, and you're gonna imagine putting in some additional physics, whatever virtual world you pick, imagine you put in some additional physics like particle simulation. So you can do hailstorms, boulder fields, snow, rain, and so on. But it's going to be in that virtual world, not just as art, but as something that can be interacted with. A lot of virtual worlds, beautiful graphics these days, they can draw a lot of this stuff but we want to try and make our avatars able to interact with them. And whatever physics you, you uh, imagine that your avatar can dream up, I want you to think about affordances that go with it. How do you advertise how the avatar can interact with that particular kind of physics in the virtual uh, world? So uh, maybe you want to do particle simulation. Maybe you want to put wind uh, or water into your environment that you have flow. Uh, how, would avatar, how would you advertise to avatars that they can interact with that? Deformable objects. It's tricky to get the physics for that right. It's one of the reasons it's one of the last things that's being added to virtual worlds. Soft materials, rubber, springs, earth, anything clay, anything that's deformable, tricky to do. Um, and how would these things project affordances? Okay, here's my simple example down here. I'm gonna put uh, soft materials into my virtual world, and I'm gonna put a trampoline in this virtual world, and I'm gonna show the avatar objects being dropped onto it. So that, that advertises that things have mass because they're gonna fall and they're gonna deform the surface of the trampoline. And then finally, I'm gonna put next to it steps leading up to it which should shout the affordance, you can also interact with the trampoline, right? Okay, turn to your neighbor and I'll give you a couple minutes to think about additional physics and additional affordances and then we'll see what you came up with.
Okay, ideas. So we uh, forgot the introduction to you, back to the Wild West. Okay. And um, in that game, there's like robots and stuff like that that you can use to travel through water. But we were thinking, what if you add you know, a full wind flow system and you add sailboats? Um, and the way that you could like, you know, display that to the users, maybe you could have stuff as simple as just flags, you know, and the flags are billowing in the wind. Yep. Um, so maybe players will be like, oh, look, there's like a wind mechanic. Then they get to water and they see like, you know, there's a boat that has sails on it and it's like anchored or docked or whatever. And you see the sails moving and you're like, I bet if I get in that, I have to get rid of that anchor, it will zoom. Absolutely, right? So we could start to advertise uh, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. Wind and water flow, and we could introduce uh, we could introduce sailboats. So you're being chased by bad guys, and you get to the dock, and you need to choose a watercraft. How would you advertise which one is the right one to take? Think about physical context here. The big one, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Right? Again, we're talking about physics here. Maybe that one isn't as dirty, possibly. May, can machines be broken in your virtual environment? There's a great additional dynamic and how you would advertise that. One being, assuming that you can play the bad guy in this game, you have one sailing pretty quickly right as you get there. Okay, possibly. It's a river, physical context. Any sailors here? Which way are you going to head on the river? Downstream. Downstream. If it's flowing, how fast is the flow of the river? Does it matter? Maybe yes, maybe no. You're the game designer. It matters, right? Is there high flow? Are there rapids? Are there sailboats? Are there motorboats? Can things be broken? All of these things you could put in the game. And if you're being chased by bad guys, you don't have time for a tutorial. You would like the objects in the world to be advertising in real time how they can be used and how they should be used given the current situation, which is I'm being chased and I don't have a lot of time. I want the fastest boat that will take me downstream. How do I know what is up and downstream immediately? And how do I know what's the fastest boat? How would I advertise that? The boat's pulling against the current. The, bo the boat is pulling against the current, right? Maybe I can see the boats are actually floating in the water if I see one that has a huge motor on the end, okay, that's a little bit easier. But if I don't have that option, there's lots of subtle cues, again, that we take for granted in the physical world that aren't necessarily there in the virtual world. And if you're thinking as a game designer as an, and as an HCI designer, remember, we want people to take their intuitions about the physical world and apply it directly to technology, which in this case is a virtual world or a, or a game. Lots of opportunity there for applying what we've talked about in terms of HCI. What are some other physics and some other affordances to go along with them that you might want to build into your virtual world? Um, we were kind of thinking about the idea of snow. Okay. And how, like, in a lot of games now, you can at least see your footprints and stuff. But um, maybe if it's sort of a lot, like, it rises up your avatar and it's slower. Absolutely. Again, in a game, snow is interesting, right? Snow is a very complex object, and it can project lots of affordances. Did someone walk this way today, yesterday, five minutes ago? Is there wind? Are there drifts? We, uh, we've been trying the lab for a long time to make a virtual snowboarding robot so we can go and approach Burton and say we'd love some funding to create some robots. Tricky to simulate snow. We haven't been able to figure that one out yet. So if anybody has any ideas, let us know. Okay. All right. So let's move on. That was our discussion about embodied and situated cognition. So we know a little bit now about what robots are and what's possible if we assume that they can push against the world and push back. They might not necessarily be robots. They may not be physical. They may be avatars. But we're thinking about these sort of interactions from that point of view. What happens if our robots, our avatars, are not just pushing against the physical world, but they're pushing against either literally or figuratively people 
So now we're moving from physical interaction to social interaction when we talk about HRI, and as you can imagine from the name, this is sort of a sister discipline to HCI. We have humans that are interacting not with one of these things, which itself cannot push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. We're interacting with something else, like an autonomous car or a Roomba, that have their own interactions with the physical world and possibly with us. Okay. Okay, so just to, ref just to sort of sum this up again and consolidate this, here's our little cartoon again, just drawn in a different manner. We have a human that can act on the environment and sense the repercussions of that action. We just finished talking about robots or machines that also can push against the environment and observe how the world pushes back. How should a robot interact with people well, again, in order to think about that, we're going to draw on social psychology. How should robots interact with people? Probably in the same way, as best we can, as the way in which people interact with people. So now we complicate our cartoon a little bit further. We have humans, environments, and robots. These two things are pushing against their environment, observing how it pushes back. And at the same time, they're observing each other and possibly acting on each other. That might be we are literally holding an object together, or the robot says something and we respond, or vice versa. This feedback loop here is social, this one is physical. And it gets interesting because obviously we can combine these things in interesting ways. So to approach HRI, thinking about creating social robots, robots that are going to interact with people, we're going to think about social interaction between people. And we're going to start simple. We're going to think about the social building blocks that we learn very on in life and that serve as the scaffolding or the foundation for learning ever more complex forms of social interaction. What are some of the very first building blocks of social interaction that you learned when you were very young? Absolutely. Mirroring or imitation. You're a very young child, mother or father says something, and you want to signal that you understand. You cannot yet say, I understand what you said, and I'm thinking about it, and I may or may not uh, obey. But you can signal very simply that at least you understood by doing the same thing, right? Simple between mother and child. We do that all the time, every day as well, in more subtle ways. We're all doing it right now. You're not imitating me literally. You're not parroting what I say. What's the imitation that's going on right now? Sometimes when I nod, you guys nod back and so on. That's my cue that you guys are absorbing most, at least, of what I'm saying, or at least you're being polite and pretending that you do, right? Hard to distinguish between those things. Okay, what are some of the other building blocks of social cognition? Some of the early ones. You gotta get them right before anything else. I think one of the earliest ones is like crying. Like okay. If you cry, something in your world happens. Something in your world happens, but you're crying because what? So in your world, that's the physical interaction, right? Something, I'm a baby, I'm helpless, something has happened that I'm not so happy about. But I want to expand now this. I want to pull on this interaction. So I cry because I want this person to come running, and I want this person to see what I'm seeing and alter this somehow. Right? So I cry in order to attract attention and signal that I'm not so happy with my interaction with the world, and I want you to fix it. I don't know how, or I don't want to. You do it. Other basic social building blocks. Um, there's like when you're young, you have to understand how you, like that, the mental model of other people. Ah, building mental so models you know, of others. others. Absolutely. Like another person is, has a similar like, process of cognition to you. Absolutely, right? This one is super important. So I'm not happy about something in my world. I want mother to come and help me with it. Mother is nearby, but mother has these big things on her ears and is, look, is not looking at me. 
Do I understand enough to know that just her being physically present might not necessarily mean that she can hear me crying and is going to respond to it, right? So mental model making is very important and starts very early on. Building mental models of others. Yeah. If that was me, what would I do? Right? So that's, that's mental model, building mental models. And goes one step beyond mental models to something called theory of mind. I can form a theory of your mind, and my theory matches my own theory about my own mind. If that happened to me, how would I respond? Probably not so well. So I maybe might not want to enter into that interaction with that individual at that time. So turn-taking, imitation, building up mental models, these all lay the groundwork for more sophisticated forms of social interaction like theory of mind. As far as I can tell for the moment, I have most of your attention. I haven't lost it yet from what I can tell and so on. Okay, so we're going to start with some very, very simple ones, even simpler than that, and I'm going to show you how these were, are being built into social robots. For some of these examples, we're going to draw on um, COG. Um, COG was, a, as you can see, a more or less humanoid robot built at MIT, uh, MIT's AI lab back in the 1990s. The idea, which you may or may not agree with, people are more willing to interact with the robot as, as it has a human form. Other people may be scared out of their wits by this robot, but we'll assume for the moment that if it looks humanoid, just by the very shape, of it being humanoid, it is going to project certain affordances. What is it about the human body that helps project hu social affordances? Body language. What's that? Body language. Body language, right? You look at your Roomba, and it's hard to tell what the Roomba's thinking or whether, it under whether it's paying attention to you or not. Not so easy, right? Does an autonomous car, does the Tesla recognize you as you're walking in the street in front of it and how do you know you hope so but it's hard to tell again this is an issue with autonomous cars a lot of our interactions with humans about whether to approach or whether to avoid has to do with social cues if we're going to build machines that are going to interact in the real world with us and may have every real possibility of harming us we better be able to determine from a distance what their intent is. Can you form a theory of mind about an autonomous car? At the moment, what it, at the moment, what would be your mental model of an autonomous car? You don't know much about it. I feel like to me it's like a binary like don't hit or like continue. Okay. So it doesn't really matter in the context, but if it's like an object there, like don't proceed. Don't don't hit objects, right? right? which hopefully most non-autonomous cars also do, right? So remember our discussion about mental models. One of the things that humans do is we port our mental models from previous technology onto new technology. There's this old technology called non-autonomous cars, and I know more or less what a non-autonomous car does, and I want, I'm going to assume as a pedestrian that an autonomous car is going to act more or less, less like a non-autonomous car. Assuming that it's sunny outside or that the sun is in my eyes and I can't see through the windshield to see whether there's someone driving or not, I shouldn't have to. If you're designing an autonomous car, you should have thought of that already and assume that pedestrians will assume that autonomous cars will act like non-autonomous cars, right? And if the autonomous car is not going to, it's about to do something that a non-autonomous car usually wouldn't do, you better send a pretty clear signal to everyone around it, that the car is now about to do something surprising. Okay. I got a good example of this is right now in, I think it's LA, one of the cities in, in California, there's like a ton of um, uh, autonomous car testing going on right now. And they like took a bunch of statistics and found out that like 85% of the accidents that autonomous cars were getting into in that city where they were getting rear-ended at stop signs. And it was just because they, you know, they go and then they see a stop sign and they just stop. And there was like no. Which non autonomous cars don't yeah. always do. Yeah. Most of us, unfortunately, drift through stop signs. Yeah. Non autonomous cars don't. 
The designers made a decision which makes obvious sense. If you're paying attention to legal context, not physical context or social context, legal context dictates there's a stop sign, you stop. Social context on, the, on American roads dictates you drift through stop signs. Right? It's an interesting HCI challenge there. What should the autonomous car do? <laughs> Great solution. Okay, that one's that one's easy. Yes. Possibly, right? So the autonomous car is going to do something that non-autonomous cars don't do, which is stop completely at every stop sign. So the car is going to give you a signal. It's going to stutter to a stop, and the rear brake lights are going to flash, which is a reminder that the car in front of you is safer than you are. Possibly. It, it's simpler to put a sticker on the back, this is an autonomous car, it's going to act differently. Is that a better affordance than flashing the brake lights as the autonomous car is approaching the stop sign? Pros and cons to both, but this is now we're back in HCI territory. Are people going to be willing to read the sign on the back of a car or see that the car is stuttering? Absolutely, right? It's doing something out of the ordinary. Sorry, behind you there. I yep. was going to say, uh, uh, some people do uh, pass their brakes before they come to the stop. Some people do. So I would say that's within the range. But how, and, and, and some motorcycles I can actually specifically pass ah. before. That's great. Yeah, exactly. Right. So some, some people do. Better to use an affordance that some people already kind of do anyways. Right. OK. Again, we're getting a little off topic here. So let's come back to COG. Um, we want to create this humanoid robot that it's easier for the humanoid robot to project social cues. <clears throat> uh, you can go read up on COG. It's now a historical artifact. But we're going to look at some examples of this. We've got th uh, three minutes left, so we're going to just start with the first of four. We're going to look at four social building blocks. There are dozens, but for our purposes, we're going to look at the first four. We're going to start with a really, really simple one, the vestibular ocular reflex, or VOR. So vestibular is coming from your inner ear, which tells you about the orientation of your head relative to gravity, ocular relating to the eyes. Um, you can try this at your leisure, but if you look at something and turn your head, your eyes will instinctually turn in their sockets in the opposite direction of your head if you're attending to an object. That's the vestibular ocular reflex. If you have a robot that's shaking its head and its eyes are moving along with its head, is that machine paying attention to you? If the machine is turning its head and keeping its eyes focused on your face, is it paying attention to you? Absolutely it is, right? So it's very, very simple. It's again, you can think of this as a Breitenberg vehicle, but it's a very, very powerful cue that I am very focused on you at the moment and I'm ignoring everything else uh, around me. Okay, so for COG, this is a relatively simple thing uh, to do. Gyroscopes in the head detect uh, head motion. So it moves its head and it detects head motion. It detects the angle and then turns the cameras in the opposite direction. So whatever the cameras happen to be looking at another person or an object, uh, COG will keep its eyes focused on that person. I had a friend who worked um, in the MIT AI lab back in the days when COG was being built. Uh, my friend was in the lab late at night one night and they were working on COG and COG was sitting off in the corner. It was late at night, there was nobody else in the lab. And the VOR was kind of working, but kind of not. So every once in a while, COG would sit still for minutes or hours, and then suddenly would turn its head and look, and then gradually turn its <laughs> face away, but keep looking in that direction. My friend very quickly stopped working in the AI lab nights. OK, I think we will stop there. You have a quiz due tonight. Deliverable 10 is due tomorrow. We'll talk about final project on Thursday. Thank you.